Hi guys. So today we are starting Rebel. Woo! So Rebel is the fourth book, fourth and final book in the Legend series. So we finished up Champion on Friday and uh, then there was an epilogue and in the epilogue there was a time jump where it was 10 years later. 10 years later? Yeah, 10 years later. Um, so now we are revisiting that same time where it is 10 years later and we are in Ross City, Antarctica in 2142 the year. Um, it starts off with a State of the Union from Antarctica, which I think is very interesting. So I'm going to read that to you first. Let us never forget the pain that our ancestors have suffered and are still suffering all around the world. Let us never forget the struggle between global tyranny and democracy that led us to found this free nation of Antarctica, where every person has the chance to work their way up from nothing, and where technology, not human ego and error, governs how successful you can become. Our level system may seem like a game, but it is far more than that. It is a tool used to help each of us live the life we deserve, and it will become the reason why Antarctica is the greatest nation on Earth. So we're going to learn more about this level system that they have. All right, so chapter one, Eden. Chapter one, Eden. If you ask me to tell me about my, tell you about myself, I'd say first that I'd like to understand things. I always have. Ever since I was a kid, I've been a tinkerer, prying apart old gadgets and laying out the innards of a broken radio or clock or a toaster, delighting in the puzzle of making something new out of something old. It doesn't have to be a human-made machine either. I love watching ants march in a line to a bit of food, take it apart and carry it single back as file back to their hill. I love the way flowers bloom and then wilt. I even preserve them forever by just pressing them between the pages of a book. I like figuring things out, the how and the why. My mother once called me her little alchemist, told me that she believed I could turn rust into gold and that I would ramble on about every little detail that makes up something until I ran out of breath. I skipped the last few semesters at my high school to become one of the best students at Ross University of Sciences, the top ranked college in the world. And I'm about to graduate with an advanced degree after seven years which should have taken 10. I've already got an internship lined up back in the Republic. And in a couple of months, I'll be headed there for an orientation session. But most people don't know me like this. Instead, they'll say, this is Eden Vitar Wing, Daniel's younger brother. That's who I am to others. I understand why, of course. I may be a star student, good at figuring things out, but my brother is Daniel Alden Wing. 10 years ago, he was known as Day boy from the streets who led a revolution that saved the Republic of America. His name was spray painted on buildings, his profile drawn on both rebel pamphlets and wanted posters. He went from being a notorious criminal to a national hero in the span of a year. There are documentaries about what he did during the war between the Republic and the colonies, about all that he sacrificed for his country, for me, he had nearly died. Yeah, it's kind of hard to top that. After the war ended, we moved here to Ross City, Antarctica, and during that time, I finished school and Daniel became an agent in the Antarctic Intelligence Service. Daniel, at least, is eager to leave our past behind. But that doesn't mean anyone has forgotten his name or his face. There are still times when we, we get stopped in the streets or when I'll overhear people murmuring as we pass by. That's Day, Daniel Alton Wing, a legend. And that's his little brother, Eden. Over the years, I've let this become the version of myself that everyone knows. Eden, the little brother. Not Eden the Tinkerer, the inventor. They don't know how I'm drawn to understand things or how I've had nightmares almost every night since the Republic's war ended. No, my identity is permanently tied to my brothers, regardless of what I do or think. I don't tell most people who I am. I don't talk about the questions that run through my mind or the nightmares that keep me awake at night. People instinctively know to avoid someone who carries a weight on his chest as heavy as mine. So most who know me just see the quick smile and the earnest face and hear the breathless rapid fire chatter about the inner workings of a the machine. They don't see the boy who startles awake at the sound of fireworks popping outside, convinced that it's the thunder of gunfire as soldiers break into our home. They don't see the boy who forces himself to stay up one more hour, just so it means one less hour of calling for his mother in his dreams. So it means not feeling embarrassed for still not being over her death. 
I like to show my bright side because it puts people at ease. Eden, who's going to be just like his brother when he grows up. Not even Daniel seems to really get who I am. When I pretend I'm okay, it makes my brother happy. And when he's happy, I can believe that I am too. But at night, my dreams are filled with scenes of the Republic. They seep into every corner of my vision. All the good memories and the horrific ones, blending together so thoroughly that sometimes I can no longer tell one apart from the other. Does Daniel have nightmares? If he does, he's never mentioned them to me. The Republic, my past, these are things I haven't been able to figure out, to understand. Maybe that's why I ended up applying for an internship back in Los Angeles, because I miss it. Because I want to make it better by turning the trial stadiums into hospitals, universities, and museums. Because also it, but also because it haunts my dreams, those old streets and faded memories. Because I can't stop thinking about it in the quiet and the dark. The brother that Daniel and I lost, the mother we will never see again, the father I never knew. The ghosts walking my sleep, walk my sleeping world, calling me back home. I think about the Republic all the time. I wonder what it was like when I was small. I mull over and over the few broken memories I have. I read every article about the Republic that I can find. It's the hole in my past, the part that makes no sense to me, and I'm obsessed with understanding it. I need to comprehend what happened in my childhood, how I managed to survive one of the darkest moments in our history. But maybe that's stupid, you know, because sometimes it's impossible to understand something. Sometimes things don't happen for a reason. The family we lost, the war that engulfed our lives, there's nothing to figure out. There is no how or why. Sometimes things just happen. To understand Ross City, my home, you need to tour it in two separate halves. Let's start with the sky floors, where Daniel and I live. Ross City is the capital of Antarctica, one of the most advanced nations in the world. Compared to the Republic of America, it's an absolute utopia. Its towering skyscrapers are stacked to the heavens, sealed securely inside a biodome that keeps temperatures comfortable and simulates a regular day-night cycle during the long summer and winter months. Don't ask me how it works. I've searched online for years and worn my brother down with questions about it, but it's still a fascinating and somewhat frustrating mystery to me. Daniel and I live in one of the wealthiest sectors, the sky floors. The top half of the skyscrapers where there are sunlight and stars and fresh air, where the buildings are interconnected like a web by long walkways covered up in green, green ivy. Up here, each floor is made up of luxury homes, shops, fancy restaurants, schools, not a single crack in the pavement, not a flower or shrub out of place. A kaleidoscope of massive virtual commercials and murals lights up each side of every skyscraper, all the images in a constant state of rotation. Looking out across the city from up here is like staring out into a rainbow sea. In the winter, the skies light up with the aurora australis, the southern lights, and paint the nights with brilliant bands of turquoise and gold. In the summers, the biodome simulates the night for us, and we get the same effect with virtual displays. To people who have lived here all their lives, this is a completely normal neighborhood perched high in the sky. To me, it's a multicolored wonderland, as alien a place as the colonies of America. And it's where I am now, at Ross University, on the top floor of Building 23 in downtown Ross City, where I'm currently trying to figure out the best way to sneak out of the complex before everyone else gets dismissed from class. I peek my head out from my lecture room into the empty halls. The university is a neoclassical wonder of a place. Antarctica likes to pay homage to its grand civilizations of the past, like the Romans and the Egyptians. I never learned about those societies back in the Republic. I didn't even know what neoclassical meant until recently. It's not something my old homeland ever showed anyone, what buildings used to look like in the days before the Republic existed. So the university is full of light-filled geometric spaces and straight columns currently adorned with moving virtual murals designed by students and the art majors. And when the halls are as quiet as they are right now, you can hear the fountain outside the front entrance. Beyond that, walkways link this floor to the same floor in nearby buildings, so that it all looks like a honeycomb with interconnected ridges. A few other students wander the school's halls, but otherwise, I'm alone. Perfect. I wait a second longer, then lower my eyes, hoist my backpack higher onto my shoulders, and walk in the direction of the main entrance as quickly as possible. If I'm lucky, I won't bump into anyone. I know until I make it outside, where my friend Presso should be waiting for me. Virtual images and text hover over parts of my view, changing as I go. There are titles like Organic Chemistry and Theoretical Physics above the classrooms. A virtual level hangs above the head of every person in the hall, 
level 64, level 78, level 52. Interactive virtual buttons drift over the potted plants lining the walls. They say, water, plus one point. Other buttons hover over the classrooms. Organic chemistry fin final, A, plus 100 points, B, plus 50 points, C, plus 10 points, D, minus 50 points, F, minus 100 points. All of this, the labels on the classrooms, the points you can earn for watering plants or taking tests, the level that each of us belongs to, is part of Antarctica's level system. Everyone in Antarctica has a chip embedded under their skin, right behind their left ear. Through that chip runs the technology that overlays virtual images over your vision. It tracks what actions you make throughout the day. It assigns you a level based on those actions. And then that level floats above your head so that everyone can see what it is. Everything you do here earns you points that goes towards your level. The more good things you do, score well on a test, help someone cross the street and so on, the more points you earn towards your level. The more bad things you do, cheat, steal, pick a fight, the more points you lose. The higher your level, the more privileges you're allotted. At level seven, you earn the right to use the city's public bus, train, and elevator stations. You're allowed to rent a home. At level 10, you're permitted to shop for fresher produce, as well as eat certain types of foods and walk into certain restaurants. To even set foot up here on the sky floors where Daniel and I live, you need a level of at least 50. This is how Ross City uses its level system as an incentive. And it's meant to encourage people to do good and discourage them from being bad. Apparently, it's the fairest government ever designed, created after Antarctica realized that the rest of the world was stuck suffering in the same cycles of tyranny and dictatorships over and over again. I mean, I'm from the Republic. I get what Antarctica is going for. But as I hurry down the halls toward the entrance, all I can think about is that no matter how virtuous the system is, some people just don't care to be good. And sure enough, a familiar voice behind me take, makes me cringe. Hey, it's Wing. Hey. Damn it. I swear under my breath, shrug my shoulders and pick up my pace. My glasses slide down my nose as I hurry and push them up nervously, accidentally smudging one eyepiece a little with my finger. Despite Antarctica's advanced technology, the chip in my head can't fix my eyes, which were damaged by the Republic's plagues long ago. So glasses are still a part of my life. Behind me, the voice only gets closer. Now I can hear the beat of the other footsteps accom accompanying it. Hey, Wing, slow down. Where are you going in such a rush? Alan, Emerson, and Jenna. It's too late to avoid them. So instead, I take a deep breath and try to look as calm as they look, try to look calm as they come up on either side of me. We're all the same age, except they're undergraduate seniors, or as I'm in the graduate program. The first, Emerson, grins as he slows down to match my stroll. You're always heading out in such a rush, he says, putting a casual hand on my backpack and grabbing the top strap of it. He pulls me back. I shrug, keeping my eyes straight. Just meeting a friend, I reply. To my relief, my voice stays even and lighthearted. Your friend, Jenna says on the other side. Pressa, right? The assistant janitor? My friend Pressa doesn't attend the university. She doesn't have a high enough level. Instead, she manages all the floor bots that sweep around our halls, cleaning them every morning and afternoon. I hear the sound of my backpack unzipping behind me before I can respond. You're amazing, Wing. Alan, the third student, marvels in false admiration. All our books are downloaded into virtual systems. But you still carry physical science books around? Emerson takes one of the books out of my bag. That's because he doesn't use them for studying, he says, flipping the book open. I snatch my backpack away. Be careful with that. But he's already shaking the book. Out fall delicately pressed flowers, goldenrods, blue bonnets, fragile winter lilies that I'd carefully placed between the pages. I suck in my breath at the sight and drop into a hurried crouch to pick them up. Already, several of them have come apart from the fall, leaving their ruined, ruined petals strewn on the marble floor. My cheeks redden as I hear a couple of snickers above me. The light sheen of my sweat on my nose makes my glasses slide down again, and I push them back up, hating the awkward gesture. I didn't know you were such a talented florist, Jenna says. I try to ignore her and pick up the rest of the dried plants and place them back into their pages. Now, other people in the halls are looking at me as I work. I love flowers. Their colors, their fragility, the way they grow, the way they smell. I was going to dry these out and put them into frames, but I'm too embarrassed to say it. Pressing flowers isn't the kind of hobby that boys are allowed to take up. It's not the kind of interest that gets you friends. My brother would probably never be caught dead doing this. Need some help? Emerson asks, stooping, stooping down to my level. 
As he bends down, he intentionally steps on the flower, still on the floor. A surge of anger pierces through my palm, and I shove him backward. Get off those, I snap at him. But the flowers are already ruined. Accosting classmate, minus 10 points. The text pops up over my view before I can stop myself, and the negative points glow red in my account. Emerson gives, gives a mock look of shock. Oh, sorry. I didn't see where they were. He holds his hands up. It was an accident. Don't get too rough. This is how they treat me every day. It's a careful kind of bullying, one that doesn't trip the level system. They're not saying anything obviously cruel to me. They're not pushing or shoving me. So the level system doesn't catch it, doesn't deduct points for harassment. Emerson hands my book back to me, then pats me twice on the shoulder. Well, hope you have a fun time with the janitor. His voice stays friendly and warm. Yet another way he tricks the level system. If you see your brother, tell him I say hi. Janice brightens at the mention of Daniel. Tell him I say hi too. The last time Daniel came to see me at the university, Jenna had blushed bright red and giggled all around him. Emerson and Alan had peppered him with questions about what it was like being the champion for a nation. Daniel, as usual, kept his answers polite and distant, but it didn't change how I felt standing there on the sidelines. I stare at the dried flowers in my hand, feeling like, feeling like an idiot. How would Daniel do here at Ross University? He was never the studious type, because he never had to be. Daniel is day. He can run up the sides of buildings, evade the police, jump through a fourth story window. Me? I'm the nerd with bad eyesight, who likes building things and framing flowers. When I speak, my voice is higher and softer than my brother's. He is the hero who never has nightmares anymore. I am the odd quiet one that he still treats like a kid. I shove the crumpled flowers in my backpack, then crush them further by dropping my books into the bag on top of them. Anger simmers beneath my skin, along with embarrassment. Hey! Presses at the front of the, uh, front of the entrance, leaning against the tree and waiting for me. Her face is round and smooth, and light brown, the shape of her eyes slender, and when she gives me that easy smile, one of her teeth is endearingly crooked. Her smile vanishes immediately at the look on my face. What happened to you? She asks as I approach her. I got to know Pressa when I started showing up early at school every morning to work on my inventions. I helped her speed up her work by installing additional code into the cleaning bots. We've been hanging out ever since. In a university full of hostility, she's been a lone comfort. I think about telling her everything that just happened. If anyone understands what it's like to deal with some of these seniors, it's Pressa. But the words lodge in my throat, refusing to come out. Real men don't press flowers into their books. They don't spill their insecurities to their friends. Daniel certainly doesn't tell me about all the things that happened to him in the past. Real men suck it up and change the subject until their hearts wither to dust inside them. So I fold the words back into my mind and smile instead. Nothing, I reply. Just glad to be out of class. She gives me a sidelong glance as if she doesn't really believe me, but she doesn't push me further. Her arm loops through mine. Still want to head to the Undercity? She asks me. I nod as we head toward the elevators. I've been ready all day, I reply. She grins and gives me a wink that shows she, that oh, she knows always improves my mood. Good, because there's a drone race happening later this week, and at least 100,000 cores waiting to be won. I figured we could go enter our bets. Drone racing, gambling. These are dangerous activities in the seediest part of Ross City, but it's the one place where I feel good about myself. I grin back at her, admiring the way her bobbed hair forms a straight line in her jaw. Then I unhook my backpack from one shoulder and reach into it. I pull out a small circular tube. Ressa's mouth forms an O as she studies it. Is that what I think it is? She whispers. I smile a little. If you're thinking it's a drone engine, then you'd be right, I reply. I've been working on it for weeks. Good thing Emerson didn't dig any farther than my dried flowers. This time, we don't have to, have to just place a bet. We can enter the race. Pressa shakes her head and grins. Sometimes I wonder if you belong up here in the sky floors, she says. You have way more in common with the rest of us down here. I don't answer her as we head up to the nearest head into the nearest elevator and start making our way down. Maybe she's right. I don't fit in up here, in the sky floors where everything's perfect until it isn't. My heart belongs in the lower floors, the part of this place that hosts things like drone races and gambling, the part that Ross City doesn't advertise, the Undercity. Daniel, not day, Daniel. Eden's not picking up his phone again. 
I tap off the virtual ringing icon in my view, swear under my breath, and try calling him one more time. Maybe the connection's bad. I am currently in the pockmarked streets of the Undercity, after all. Perched in the shadows on top of a crumbling neon sign overlooking a crowded street. This is the lowest rung of Ross City, the ground floor, where sunlight never reaches, and where neon signs advertise the rusty jumble of cheap storefronts lining either side of the road. It's not like this is the best place to make a call in the sky, to the sky floors. No answer again. I take a deep breath and try not to be annoyed. When we first moved here to Antarctica, I promised myself that I'd never lose my temper with Eden. He survived a gaudy revolution. He lost our parents and nearly his life. He's my little brother and nothing would ever be worth getting angry with him about as long as he is alive and healthy. Still, you'd think a kid could get around to calling his brother back now and then. Maybe he's hanging out with classmates. I don't know much about who he talks to these days. Last time I visited him at school, he seemed friendly with some seniors named Jenna and Emerson, but they were heading into their finals for the year. That means he's going to be out more, doesn't it? Concept of a university, of taking exams without real consequences, is so foreign to me that trying to figure out Eden's life nowadays gets me nowhere. June would probably understand him better. I wonder for a moment if I could use this as an excuse to call her, get her opinion on how Eden might be feeling. My thoughts always wander to June. I fiddle idly with a paperclip ring on my left hand, left hand, try to force her out of my head, and call my brother one last time. He doesn't answer. I sigh, give up, and turn on the geolocation tracking on him. That's another feature of Antarctica's level system. You can at least find out where someone is. Any sign of her? The voice comes on my earpiece. It's from my AIS co-agent, co Jessen. I let Eden's geolocator keep searching and instead focus back on my job. My eyes scan the bustling marketplace, marketplace below me. Not yet, I mutter. Jessen sighs over the line. She's late. Maybe she's not heading out today. Give her a few more minutes, yeah? Fine. Jessen hangs up, and I go back to my watch. It's a good thing I'm crouched in the shadows here. People always recognize me, for one reason or another. My face is the one thing they've seen before on the news, on the wanted posters that used to plaster every gaudy jumbotron back in the Republic of America. Now it's the one that appears whenever you've committed a crime against Ross City. It's the one you see right before I arrest you. My name used to be Day, the boy from the streets of the Republic, the fugitive who unwittingly started a revolution. Now, though, I'm Daniel Altonwing of the Antarctica Intelligence Service. My job is to hunt down the worst criminals in Ross City. Here, apparently, I'm the law. Pretty ironic for me, yeah? Unlike other AIS agents, I'm kind of a fluke. I grew up in the grungy, broken streets of Lake. I stole and fought and scraped by with the worst of them. I used to be the most wanted criminal in the Republic, a street rat who somehow got the credit for making a government crumble and rebuild itself. I know what it's like to live in the worst places in the world. Most of the others I work with didn't grow up like that. Certainly not my co-agents, Jessen and Lara. They're Anarchans, born and raised here in the glitzy, hyper-advanced technological wonderland of Ross City. So they tend to treat me with a sense of curiosity and awe. What's it like, they ask me with wide eyes, to live in a world like the Republic? I usually shrug off the question. Life in the Republic is a nightmare that I prefer to leave in the past. If anyone from my Republic days saw me now, they'd probably laugh. I don't look anything like how I used to. My hair long and tied back into a knot, my cap secured tightly to obscure my features, my clothes worn and grungy from the streets. Now I'm wearing a sharp black suit and sleek black collar shirt and polished shoes and my hair's cut short and wild. I still can't get used to it, so I run my hands through my hair all the time. By the end of the day, I look like a gaudy disaster zone. I wonder what June would think of me. Then again, I wonder what she'd think of a lot of things. My leg's starting to fall asleep, so I shift my crouch and keep waiting. Today, we're down here tracking a woman who works for Dominic Holland, one of the most dangerous criminals in the Undercity. Me, Daniel Alton Wing, tracking a criminal. Sometimes the thought makes me want to crack up. But Dominic Hahn isn't anything like me. He isn't some kind of vigilante fighting for justice or for his family. He's a killer, cold and merciless. In the past few years, Hahn has become the most notorious name in the Undercity's crime circles. He's, he left bodies hanging in the middle of intersections, gutted and mutilate, mutilated. He's run illegal racing rings down here. He gives out loans to anyone not living in the sky floors, to people with low levels who are desperate and hungry, and then comes for them and their families if they can't pay him back with double the amount. No one who's crossed paths with Han seems to want to talk about him, 
it's been hard to gather info. Some people ask me why I chose to work in such a dangerous job after everything that's happened to me. I'm not sure, actually. Maybe it's because the thought of someone terrorizing the poor down here reminds me too much of my past. Maybe it's because this is the world I know and crossing paths with danger is something I'm good at. Not that I like being familiar with all this. The Undercity is a far cry from the gleaming luxury of the sky floors. This is where the poorest people in Lost City are. Spilled garbage and rusted scooters stripped of parts litter the intersections down here. Crowds of people stream by underneath me like a tide of ants. Through my vision, I can see their virtual levels hovering, hovering over their heads. Level 6, level 10, level 14. My gaze settles on a few homeless people crouched against the walls, begging idly for spare change. Level 0 hovers over their heads. People with level 0 have no rights at all. They can't rent housing. They can't take the trains. They barely have the right to rest in the streets. You can work your level up, of course. That's the whole point of the system. Over time, some people in the lowest floors have been able to level up to the mid floors and get better access, get access to better food, housing, and transportation. But pulling yourself up that way takes an overwhelming amount of work. Most never make it out. Ross City is still a better place than the Republic's ever been. What advanced nation doesn't have some poverty? At least these people have never been subjected to the Republic's trials or the colony's stifling corporations. But as far as I see, no place in the world treats their lowest rungs well. That's why I hate being in the Undercity. It's too much like life in Lake, going hungry and sleeping in alleys. Every time I come down here, I end up having nightmares. People may think of me as some kind of shining hero, but honestly, all I really wanted in the first place was to protect my family. Suddenly I tense, my posture straightens, my gaze fixates on a woman who had just emerged from the bodega underneath my neon sign. She glances furtively behind her, then merges into the crowd with a shrug. I tap my ear once. Time to go, I say to Jessen, then hang up and rise. I shrink farther back into the shadows of the building, slide off the neon sign, and start inching down the second, inching along the second story ledge. Down below, the woman's moving surprisingly fast. If I wasn't specifically tracking her, I would have lost her in the crowds. My feet move with the assurance of someone who's done this a thousand times before. I hop between ledges to another building, then another, my figure never emerging from the shadows. My fingers search instinctively for the next crevice in the wall to grip. Up ahead, the woman turns down a narrow side street and makes her way through a food market. I stop short of the turn and cut instead through the back side of the buildings, then shimmy down from the second store ledge to land in an alley leading out to the market. Smoke from open grills ling lingers in the air, layering the street here in a haze. I keep the woman's light brown hair in sight as I hurry from one alleyway to the next. At least the people here are so preoccupied with hawking food that none of them notice a ghost slipping behind their stalls, a shadow moving among them. Gradually, I edge closer. The woman looks back every few minutes like clockwork. After a while, I kick off against the wall in an alley and move up to the third floor. My speed picks up. A series of laundry lines connect the next building with the one I'm currently on. I step onto the line, crouch to grab it with my hands, then use my momentum to swing down to the second floor. Now I'm just a few paces behind her. Her movements are quick and nervous, as if she sensed that someone may be watching her. My eyes flash briefly to the buildings around me. Jessen and Lara should be on their way too, closing the trap around her. The woman abruptly darts into what looks like a dead end. I hop into a second floor balcony and swerve around the corner of the block after her. When I reach the alley, I see her about to slide through a narrow corridor at the end of it, but Jessen's already there on the other side. She steps out of the shadows, wearing the exact same black outfit as me, and points a gun at the woman. The woman whirls around to try and run back the way she came, but I'm already there. In one move, I leap from the second story balcony, grab the edge of the sign, and swing myself down. I land right in front of her and pop up onto my feet, my hands in my pockets. I don't think so, I say. She throws a punch at me, but I step to one side and easily dodge her. Cuffs are already in my hands. As she stumbles past me, carried forward by her own momentum, I seize one of her arms and pull it behind her back. I snap one handcuff against her wrist, then the other. Alexandra, I'm in, I say through gritted teeth as she struggles against my grip. She doesn't answer, but there's a desperation to her moves that betrays who she is. I allow myself a small smile at Jessen, as Jessen and Lara both approach me now. Jessen sighs and claps her hands together, while Lara runs a hand across the smooth, tight bun knotted high on her head. About time, Jessen mutters as she places a call to AIS's headquarters. This one was elusive. Keeps our jobs interesting, yeah? 
I replied to her with a lift of my eyebrow. Lara barks out a laugh at that. We've been tracking this woman for a month. She'd reportedly been Dominic Khan's personal assistant, gathering info for him and helping him run messages down here in the Undercity. Our intel on her told us she grew up with him and was about his age. She's a lot younger than I thought she'd be. I remember about the rumors about Dominic Khan himself, supposedly the youngest crime lord in Ross City, and wonder what other gossip about him might be true. This will bring us one step closer to hunting him down. I start to recite the woman's rights to her. You have the right to be judged before a court of Antarctican residents in addition to your Antarctican level system. Before you stand trial, you have the right to. She twists around in my hands and gives me a wild, terrified look. I have a daughter, she whispers to me. Her name is Ashley Amin. Don't let Han punish her because I've been caught. Please. I blink, taken off guard. Nothing will happen to your family, I tell her. My voice turns low and steady. I can hear the fear in her words. I promise you, we just need your help. That's when I notice a light foam building at the edge of her lips. Her skin has turned ashen and sweaty, and I realize the trembling of her limbs isn't from fear. She turns those wide eyes back on me again. Her gaze sears straight through me. Don't let him hurt my daughter, she gasps. Foamy spittle flying. Don't let him. She keeps repeating the words deliriously. I curse and get glance at Jessen. Call for help, I say. She's poisoned herself. Jessen taps on something in her view without hesitation. My stare whips back to the woman. I shake her once as her eyes start to glaze over. I'll protect your daughter. Where can we find Hond? I demand. What's the next project? The woman's head lolls to one side. Nearby, Jessen is calling for an ambulance. Drone races, the woman finally whispers. Her voice is so quiet now that I can barely catch it. Drone races, I say. Where? But her eyes roll back and she goes limp in my arms. I shake her again, but her body has stopped trembling. When I touch my fingers to her throat, I can't find a pulse. I'm no str stranger to dead bodies, of course. I've seen my fair share ever since I was a kid. After all, I'd been left for dead myself by the Republic, and I had to crawl my way out of a lab's mortuary when I was ten years old. I'd played dead for years in the streets of Lake. I'd seen my own mother and brother slaughtered. I'd witnessed plenty more deaths when the war broke out in earnest between the Republic and the colonies. But that has never numbed me. Every time I come face to face with death on this job, I feel the same sickening despair settled deep in my stomach. The same sense of repulsion and grief. This is my fault. I shouldn't have questioned her so severely. I should have checked to make sure she wasn't swallowing some kind of poison. I should have stopped her. Now she's dead, and we're left with barely a thread of info about Han. I lay the woman on the ground and slowly push myself back onto my feet as Jessen and Lara pat down her lifeless body. What kind of man is Han to inflict such deep fear in his assistants that they'd rather kill themselves than be captured? What would Han have done to this woman if she'd lived? The blare of the ambulance arrives in the alley's intersection, and in days, I look on as two people clad in white rush to the body. Lara walks up to me and folds her arms. Drone races, eh? She asks. I nod. If anyone finds out when the next one is, I reply, don't let them shut it down yet. We'll be there if Han's going to show his face. Lara nods. Too bad about this one, she says, shaking her head. I felt a little sorry for her. Wouldn't have to feel sorry for her if the level system was fair, I mutter. She sighs in exasperation. Not this again. People like this work for Han because they don't have a choice. Hey, you want to argue about it? Take it up with Min. Min Garen, the AIS director. I've brought it up before. Not that anyone wants to hear it. So I just shrug and give Lara a sidelong look. If you actually think that'll do any good, I'll talk to her. I'll even dress in costume and do a skit. We watch as hospital workers cover the woman with a cloth. At least bodies here are treated with some semblance of respect. A memory flashes through my mind. The old trauma of waking up in a sea of bodies, of dragging myself out while clutching my bleeding, ruined knee that had been experimented on. Are you all right, Daniel? Justin asks me as she peers at my face. I hadn't even noticed her come up to me. I'm fine, I reply shaking the memory off. Already I know what my dreams tonight will be about. The sooner we can get out of the Undercity and back to the sky floors, the better. I can't stand this gaudy place anymore. As we turn around and start to head back to the main street, a virtual alert pings in my view. It's a floating icon of Eden with a glowing green circle around it. While I when I tap on it, a map pops up with a location dot. Guess the systems finally tracked my brother down. I stop short, narrow my eyes to study it more closely. Oh, hell no. 
I muttered to myself. Beside me, Justin frowns. Hell no what, she says. The location does blinking not far from where we currently are. Eden's not hanging out in the sky floors at all. He's here in the Undercity. That's where we'll pause for now. And we'll pick back up tomorrow. Yeah. Cool. All right. So I will see you guys tomorrow and we'll continue with the next Eden chapter. We got up to page 27. All right. So I'll see you guys tomorrow and we will read more of Rebel. All right. Bye.